In this video, I will demonstrate the performance of a discriminant analysis. Discriminant analysis has two basic purposes, uh, and that's to describe uh, major differences among groups following a MANOVA analysis, and also to classify subjects into groups based upon a combination of measures. So the idea here is to take a group of predictor variables, which are typically going to be quantitative in nature, either interval or ratio based, and then use those to try and predict group membership. So if a subject will or will not have a certain characteristic or will not or will belong to a certain group, and then using these predictor variables we can predict whether or not they would belong to one of these two groups. Now examples of this might be trying to find variables that could predict whether or not someone would pass an exam, uh, trying to predict whether or not someone would develop a disease or an illness or an injury, uh, whether or not someone might have a certain characteristic or trait um, in psychology or education. So we can use this to try and figure out what variables would help differentiate group membership, which is somewhat the opposite of MANOVA. In MANOVA, we're using uh, groups to try and predict differences among multiple variables. Now we're using these quantitative variables to try and predict who will or will not belong to a certain group. So based upon its name, what we're trying to do is gather a group of predictor variables that can help discriminate or can help differentiate why subject A might belong to group 1 and why subject B might belong to group 2. So the logic then of discriminant function um, is to try and identify uncorrelated linear combinations of these predictor variables. And so these uncorrelated linear combinations are referred to as discriminant functions. So if we can identify the uncorrelated variables, we can identify which variables discriminate between group membership. This is very similar in respects to logistic regression and how we go about using variables to predict a single outcome that is categorical. Now how we interpret these results is pretty straightforward since they tend to parallel what we've seen with some of the other types of regression or prediction kinds of analyses that we've done. The main result obtained from a discriminant analysis is the summary of what we refer to as the discriminant functions, um, which is similar to factors or components when we talk about multiple regression or factor analysis. Now in the case when there's more than one predictor variable or more than one group of uncorrelated linear combinations of predictions, uh, these combinations basically consist of regression equations. So raw scores on each original variable are multiplied by assigned weights and then summed together in order to obtain a discriminant score, which is similar to or analogous to a factor score or component score, like in factor analysis. So the analysis returns several indices, many of which we have uh, talked about before in some of the other multiple regression equations or analyses. Uh, we have eigenvalues and percentage of variance explained are provided for each discriminant function. And these values are interpreted very similarly uh, as we would see in factor analysis or principal component analysis. We also see a value reported called the canonical correlation. And this value is equivalent to the correlation between the discriminant scores and the levels of the dependent variable or the outcome. Now we can have, typically, traditionally, we have only two levels of the outcome. They either pass or fail. They either do or don't have the outcome of interest. But we can evaluate more than two levels of outcome. We can evaluate three, four, or more levels of outcome. But typically, this is used when we have a dichotomous outcome. So a high value for this canonical correlation indicates a function that discriminates well between subjects. In other words, it will likely perform well in terms of classifying subjects into dependent variable groups. So it's important to realize that when the canonical correlation is less than perfect, in other words, not equal to 1.0, there's going to be some degree of error reflected in the ability to predict group assignment or group membership. So that's, a, that's an important consideration as we go forward and evaluate some of the outcomes that we're going to do in our example. We'll talk a little bit about that. Another portion of the results that's vital to our interpretation um, involves the actual coefficients for each discriminant function. 
So similar to regression coefficients and multiple regression, these coefficients serve as the weights assigned by the formula to the various original variables in the analysis. How we determine the accuracy of the actual prediction from the analysis is the number of correct classifications that is made using the predictor variables. And this is known as the hit rate. And so this hit rate, or these predictions of the group membership, is compared to the actual group membership of subjects in our original sample data. So a table, as we'll see when we look at the output uh, in a few minutes, is a table showing the actual group membership and then the predicted group membership is, is given to us. And so this table includes the percentage of correct classifications based upon the equation or the predictors. And then we also get the uh, the actual percentage of, or the actual percentage of people being in one group membership versus the other. So even though there's no rule of thumb regarding an acceptable rate of correct classifications from the analysis, we certainly want to achieve a high percentage and when we get up into the 90s or above, that's considered to be obviously excellent prediction. Now one consideration we have when we, when we look at the the ability to make these these correct classifications is it's important that we want our hit rate to be high we want our 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 analysis to be able to produce a high rate of correct classifications another consideration is, is possibly the cost of miscalculation so to a researcher it may look initially really good to us so we have a hit rate of 90 to 95 percent but what about the small percentage of cases that are classified incorrectly. So there exists some pretty large ramifications if we miscalculate an individual for group A, for example, into group B, resulting in a greater cost than miscalculating someone in the other direction. So for example, assume we wanted to classify subjects as either high or low risk in terms of developing heart disease based upon family history and maybe some uh, health behaviors. So obviously labeling a person low risk when in fact they are high risk has a much greater cost than identifying that person as high risk when they are actually low risk. So it's important to realize that there are issues that, that can't be necessarily explained through our analysis but must be assessed and interpreted uh, based upon your experience and, and your knowledge level as, as a researcher. And before we get into our actual uh, example, we do need to talk a little bit about some of the assumptions that we have when we do discriminant analysis. And one of the first assumptions, and, and this is not unusual when we talk about other types of inferential analysis, and that's that the predictor variables we assume have been randomly assigned or, or randomly selected or randomly gathered, and they must be independent of one another. So it can't be the same person being measured multiple times, they have to be independent measurements. The distribution of predictor variables has to be normally distributed. We're also assuming the variances among the predictors and within the groups. Uh, the group membership is also equal and they have similar variance. We're also assuming that the relationships among all pairs of predictors within each group are linear. So in order to run the actual analysis in SPSS, we need to first talk about the initial step in this process, and that's as we screen our data to make sure that our data is normally distributed, making sure it's complete and accurate, and we also want to screen it for any outliers. And so we can screen for outliers using techniques like the outlier labeling technique, or we can also screen for outliers similarly to how we did with multiple regression, where we use the Mahalanobis distances, for example, uh, is a way to identify outliers and then deal with those outliers. So that's an important first step in this process is making sure our data meets those basic assumptions of normal distribution and, and having equal variances. So in order to run the analysis then, and assuming we have, we have done those first steps and made sure this data is clean, accurate, and meets the assumptions, we go to the Analyze menu classify, and then discriminate. 
So we want to first of all move our outcome variable into the grouping variables box. So again, this is where we're differentiating whether or not someone passed or failed the exam. And then we have our predictor variables, which include a grade point average during the courses prior to taking the, the licensing exam or certification exam. And then we have results or scores from some standardized exams that we want to determine if those can help us predict this outcome of passing or failing. So we want to move those predictor variables over into the independence box. And so we have two options here. We can include all of the predictor variables into the analysis at once, or we can actually have the predictor variables entered into the analysis step by step. So we have either all together, uh, which is the option we're choosing here. So under independence, you can see where it says enter independence together. That's the option we're choosing. Or you could choose a stepwise method where the variables are entered in um, one at a time. Now the next thing we want to do is we need to define the range of our grouping variable. In other words, we need to tell SPSS which numbers we're using to define our groups. So for a two group situation like we have here, we're using zero and one as our numbers to define our groups. But if you have more than two groups, you might have a larger range of possible values that could be associated with the outcome. So once we've defined the range of our outcome here, we click Continue. And we click Statistics. And we want to see the means of each of the groups. We also want to see univariate ANOVAs. And then boxes M. Boxes M is going to help us determine if we've met the assumption of normal variance uh, among our groups. Then we click ooh, we one more under function coefficients. We want to make sure we choose Fisher's as well. And what Fisher's is going to help us do, it's going to give us an idea of which function coefficients maximize discrimination between the groups. So that's that's a good thing to report as far as which variables help us maximize that, that prediction. So click continue. Then click classify. Now if our group proportions uh, in the population, if the, the proportion of people that are passing or failing this exam is fairly equal in the population, then we can ch check all groups equal under uh, prior probabilities. If they're unequal, we can pick compute from group sizes. And this is the most common option, and we're going to go ahead and do that because we know that in the population there's not a 50-50 50, 50, uh, 50 pass rate for this exam. So we want to make sure we account for that and choose compute from group sizes. Now under display we want to choose summary table and then leave one out classification which will reclassify each case based upon the functions of all the other cases excluding that case. And then under use covariant matrix we want to select the default which is within groups. And then depending on the number of levels you have in your outcome, you may select one or more of the options under plots. Now the combined groups plot will create a histogram for two groups or a scatter plot uh, for three or more groups. So this option is, is useful when the DV has or the outcome has three or more levels. So the separate group groups plot creates a separate plot for each group and the territorial map charts, centroids, and boundaries, and is used only when the outcome has three or more levels. So because we only have two levels to our outcome, we're going to choose the combined groups plot. And we can click Continue, and then we click Save, so SPSS will save those functions for us. Now this last dialog box uh, gives us some options as far as saving some outcomes or output for some future analysis.
And so we've got three options, predicted group membership, discriminant scores, and probabilities of group membership. Um, it's very common to save discriminant scores and also to save the scores of the predicted group membership. So we're going to check those two and then click Continue. And now we're ready to run the analysis and we can click OK. So the interpretation of the output has, is going to basically have four parts. The first would be the analysis looking at whether or not we've met the assumptions uh, of the analysis for the data. And we're going to assume we've, we've already done that except for the for boxes test. We're going to then look at significance tests and strength of relationship statistics for each discriminant function. We're going to look at the discriminant function coefficients and then lastly look at the group classification and how accurately we're going to be able to classify subject in, into specific groups. Now the first table we can look at is labeled group statistics and this basically gives us the descriptives for each of the groups on each of the predictor variables. So as we look at group zero or the, the group of people that did not pass the exam we can see the mean scores for each of the predictor variables and then we can see the same thing for group number one the subjects that pass the exam we can see the mean scores for each of their outcome or each of their predictor variables excuse me and then we can see the totals for the two groups combined the next table we can look at is labeled tests of equality of group means and also give us some indication if in the people that were in the pass group versus the people in the fail group were they significantly different did they have mean scores that were significantly different in each of these predictor variables so did the people that passed the exam have a greater or lesser GPA than the people that failed at a statistically significant level. And so we can look at that for each of our five predictor variables. So the column we want to look at is the SIG column, which gives us an idea of the statistical significance of the group means for each of these predictors. And we can see here that for all of the predictor variables except for MAT, the, the pass group is significantly different than the fail group. And so that gives us some indication that certainly these predictor variables seem to be discriminating. So people that, that passed the exam had a statistically significant higher GPA than people that failed the exam. And we can see that again for all four of the five predictor variables. And the MAT uh, variable is trending as very close to, to statistical significance. Okay, the next thing we can look at is boxes test. And so we can look at boxes M. And boxes M will give us an idea of whether or not we have equal variance among our groups. And so we're going to look at the SIG value, significance value, within boxes M test results. And if this is greater than 0 0.001, then we make the conclusion that the group variance is equal. In other words, we've met the assumption of equal group variance. If this value is less than 0 0.001, then it means we have unequal group variance. Now we can continue with the analysis, but we need to be very careful of how we interpret and realize this now becomes a potential limitation of our analysis. Now the next table we can look at is this summary of canonical discriminant functions. And again, this gives us an idea of how strong the relationship is between the predictor variables and the outcome that we're trying to predict. And so one value of use here is here's the actual canonical correlation for our predictor variables. And so we can take this value, this 0.673 value, and we can square it and that becomes an effect size similar to an R squared value when we do multiple regression. So when we square this, gives us, this gives us an idea of the magnitude of the actual effect of the predictors on the outcome. So that's a useful thing to report. Now the next box we can look at is labeled Wilkes Lambda. And this gives us an idea of the statistical significance of the prediction model. So do the predictor variables predict the outcome at a statistically significant level? And so we look at the SIG value, and again, if that's less than 0.05, then we can say that this group of predictor variables will make predictions that are statistically significant in their accuracy.
So that's a good thing. Again, we're, we can say that we have a very strong model here. The next table we can evaluate is labeled standardized canonical discriminant function coefficients. And this is going to give us an idea of which of the individual predictor variables seems to have the highest loading or the highest predictor capability of predicting group membership. So as we can see here, GPA has the highest value, followed by MAT and AR score. And so those three values seem to have, seem to have fairly high loading, especially GPA and its ability to predict the outcome. So these are the predictors that seem to have the most effect or the best ability to predict group membership. Now we can look at the next table below this labeled structure matrix and what we try and look for to see if there's consistency in the values here and the values here. So in the upper table GPA has a very high correlation coefficient, discriminant function coefficient, and then also has a fairly high correlation coefficient we can see that AR also has a fairly high value uh, and we can see that GREV and GREQ also have fairly high values so at least for these first two variables GPA and AR there's some consistency between the discriminant function coefficient as well as the correlation between these individual variables and, and the pooled variables so there's a very strong consistency here. So GPA and AR score seem to be the best predictors um, in our ability to predict group membership. And others have less, but still fairly strong predictive ability. So the last table we want to examine is labeled classification results. And this will give us an idea of how accurately our predictor model was able to predict the actual results. So as we can look at this, we want to look at the cross-validated area of the table here. And this will give us an idea, again, of how accurately our model was able to predict the actual group membership. So as we look at the first percentage here, we can see the people that did not, here are the people that did not pass the exam, cross-reference with the people that we predicted did not pass the exam, and we were able to correctly predict about 78% of those people using our predictor variables we're not able to pass the exam. Then we look at the next column over and here we're trying to here are the people that passed the exam cross reference the people that we predicted would pass the exam and we we're able to predict about 87 percent of the people that actually passed the exam. We're able to predict those those correctly. So this indicates a fairly high prediction rate Obviously, it appears we're a little bit able better to predict the people that pass versus the people that fail. But all in all, using these five predictor variables, and especially GPA and AR score, it appears that those are the strong predictors, and this model is, is a fairly accurate model, statistically significant model, in being able to predict group membership. So if we know these five predictor variables, that will then help us be able to predict the outcome of pass or fail the exam. So again, to summarize, discriminant analysis is used when we want to predict membership in a group uh, using multiple predictor variables that tend to be quantitative. And we will then look for these unrelated correlations or these unrelated groups of correlations, that, unrelated groups of variables, excuse me, that can help discriminate or help us predict group membership. So hopefully you're able to learn something from this video and good luck using this technique in your own research.